could speak to us about stable commutator length of Bing mapping class groups. All right. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak. I am so glad to see you all and be here. Um, so this project that I'm going to be talking to you about today is joint work with Priyam Patel and Alex Rasmussen, both of whom are at the University of Utah. So most of us are probably familiar with finite type surfaces, and we know that finite type surfaces can be completely classified by their number of genus, which is going to be finite, as well as their number of punctures, which also will be finite. Today we're going to be focused on infinite type surfaces, and one way we can get infinite type surfaces is by taking any finite type surface and adding, for instance, a Cantor set of punctures. So we see here we have what we call the Cantor tree. Here we have a Cantor tree with one genus, and here we have a Cantor tree with three genus. But infinite type surfaces in general are much more wild than just coming from finite type surfaces by adding punctures. Here we have what's called the ladder surface, where we have genus going out to infinity, both in the left direction and the right direction. Here we have a cylinder with infinitely many punctures, where at each puncture I've sort of glued in a Cantor tree. So I have these Cantor trees that are going out to infinity in the left and the right. And then I also have over here an infinite type surface that has infinitely many genus. This is called our blooming Cantor tree. So at each Cantor set, can't point to the Cantor set going out to infinity, I have sort of genus going out to infinity in that direction. But it turns out that even though these are much more wild than finite type surfaces, there's still a nice classification, which now is going to be based on the number of genus that the infinite type surface has, which in this setting is potentially going to be infinite, as well as what we're going to call the spaces, the space of ends, and those ends which are accumulated by genus. And together, we're going to call these two points of data the end space of our infinite type surface. Now, we'd like to get a handle on understanding these end spaces of infinite type surfaces. And one way we can do that is by defining a partial order on the space of ends. And this partial order was first defined by Katie Mann and Khosra Rafi in 2020. And let's see what this definition is. So if I have an end space of an infinite type surface and I have two ends, X and Y, I say that X is less than or equal to Y in this partial order. If for any neighborhood I take of Y, I can find a neighborhood of X such that this neighborhood of X is sitting inside the neighborhood of Y. So think of this as Y being more complicated or more complex than the end X. And I say that X is equivalent to Y if X is less than or equal to Y and y is less than or equal to x. We can think of these as being x and y really look the same. Topologically, they're the same end space. And so e of x, this is going to denote the equivalence class of ends that are similar to x, and it's going to be the set of all ends that are similar to x. And so now we can define a partial order on the space of ends by saying an equivalence class of ends equivalent to x is strictly less complex than the equivalence class of ends related to y if the end x is less than or equal to y in this partial order and they are not equivalent. So I'm going to keep this definition up on the next page, but show you some examples. So if this is the surface that I'm working with, let's look at this end x and this end p. I see that for any neighborhood I take of this end p, I can find some neighborhood of x that's homeomorphic into that neighborhood which tells me that X is less than or equal to Y. And similarly for, uh, sorry, X is less than or equal to P. And similarly for any neighborhood I take of X, I can find some neighborhood of P that's homeomorphic into that neighborhood of X. And so that shows me that X and P are equivalent in this partial order. Similarly, X is less than or equal to Y because any neighborhood I take of Y, I can find a neighborhood of X that sort of sits inside that neighborhood but I can't find a copy of Y sitting inside of X because Y is too complex. And so the ends equivalent to Y are strictly more complex than the ends equivalent to X. So we're gonna say that an end E is maximal in this partial order if the equivalence class of ends is maximal with respect to the partial order. And M of E is gonna denote the set of maximal ends of the end space. And so for this surface here, our set of maximal ends has three elements. We have the ends that are equivalent to Y, we have the ends that are equivalent to W, and we have the ends that are equivalent to Q. 
And there's sort of no relation between these three sets of ends. So these are three separate equivalence classes of maximal ends. Now, another way that I can characterize end spaces is as being something called self-similar. So what does it mean to be self-similar? Well, it means that for any way that I decompose the end space into two pieces, I can find a clopin subset of one of those pieces that looks like the entire end space. So in particular, if my end space is self-similar, then the space of maximal ends is either gonna be a Cantor set of points that are all the same type, or I could have one special end. So in this surface here, I have this end Y that's being accumulated by genus. And any way I decompose this end space into two pieces, whichever piece contains that maximal point Y, that piece is actually gonna be homeomorphic to the entire end space. Now, I'd like to do geometric group theory with the mapping class groups of these infinite type surfaces, but it turns out that as S is an infinite type surface, while its mapping class group is a Polish topological group, the mapping class is not locally compact and its mapping class is not even compactly generated. So our normal tools of geometric group theory fail in some sort of big way here. So the question is, well, how are we gonna study the large scale geometry of these mapping class groups of infinite type surfaces? And the way we do that is using this definition, which is given to us by Christian Rosendahl in 2014. He said that given a Polish topological group, we say that a subset A is coarsely bounded in the group if A has finite diameter in every compatible left invariant metric on the group. In particular, we're gonna say the group is locally coarsely bounded if there exists some open neighborhood of the identity in the group, which is coarsely bounded, and G is going to be CB generated if there exists a generating set, which is coarsely bounded. Now, in particular, if your group is locally CB and CB generated, it turns out that your group has a well-defined quasi-isometry type. And so you can start to do geometric group theory. So we'd like to understand those mapping class groups, which are either like locally coarsely bounded or CB generated. And so what Katie Mann and Kazara Rafi do in their paper from 2020 is they give a complete characterization of those surfaces whose mapping class groups are locally coarsely bounded. So in particular, what they show is that if your mapping class group is locally coarsely bounded, then you can find some finite type subsurface K of your infinite type surface that's going to partition the ends of the surface in a really nice way. It's going to partition your end space into two pieces one piece which is gonna consist of end spaces which are self-similar, and another collection of pieces which are gonna consist of your sort of less complex ends. And in particular, each of these less complex ends is gonna be homeomorphic into a clopin subset of one of these self-similar end spaces. And every maximal end is contained in one of these self-similar end spaces. So this is kind of a lot to grapple with, but all I'm gonna care about for today is surfaces whose mapping class groups is, are locally coarsely bounded. And what this big theorem of Mann and Rafi is telling you is that if you have a surface whose mapping class group is locally coarsely bounded, then you can draw the surface like this. There's a compact subsurface K that partitions your end spaces into ends which are self-similar end spaces that contain all the maximal ends. So these were like our um, Qs, Ws, and Ys and less complex end spaces. So this was our end space X, which was homeomorphic into A3. So one fact that's going to be notable is that if you have a self-similar end space, then the set of maximal ends of that end space are either a point or a Cantor set of points that are all equivalent. And so today, what we're going to consider is we're going to consider a subset of those infinite type surfaces whose mapping class groups are locally coarsely bounded. In particular, we're going to be considering infinite type surfaces whose mapping class are locally coarsely bounded and such that every equivalence class of maximal ends is a Cantor set. So we're going to sort of not consider those infinite type surfaces whose mapping class groups are locally so coarsely bounded where you have a maximal end space or you have a maximal end that consists of only one point. We're just going to not consider those today. Now, one thing that I do along with Priam and Alex is we give a topological characterization 
for those infinite type surfaces that are what I'm going to call type star. And so where does this topological characterization come from? Well, we use a definition of Justin Malastin and Jing Tao, where they say that a surface is uniformly self-similar if that surface has zero or infinite genus, and if the end space is self-similar with a Cantor set of maximal ends. And so what I show along with Priam and Alex is that if your surface is infinite type and your mapping class group is locally coarsely bounded and every equivalence class of maximal ends is infinite, and so this is your type star surfaces, then your surface has to be the connected sum of finitely many uniformly self-similar surfaces with a finite type surface. So this is an if and only if. So it tells you that you can rewrite these surfaces that we saw from the man rafi decomposition as the connect sum of a finite type surface with a bunch of these uniformly self-similar surfaces, as long as you're throwing out those surfaces that have sort of one maximal end. Now, the next part of our result involves something known as stable commutator length. So what is stable commutator length? Well, if G is a group and I have two group elements H and K, then the commutator of H and K is defined to be H times K times H inverse times K inverse. And I'm going to write that like this. Now, if G is a group and G is an element of the commutator subgroup of G, then the commutator length of an element is just defined to be the smallest number that it takes to write that group element as a product of commutators. So being in the commutator subgroup says that you can be written as some finite product number of commutators. And the stable commutator length measures how the commutator length function grows as you pass to powers of your group element. So in particular, the stable commutator length of a group element is, to, is defined to be the limit as n goes to infinity of the commutator length of g to the n divided by n. And this is sort of measuring the growth of the commutator length as we pass to powers of our element. So it turns out that there's a really rich and deep connection between stable commutator length and big mapping class groups. This sort of started with a blog post of Danny Caligari in 2009, where he showed that the mapping class group of the sphere minus a Cantor set is uniformly perfect. And in particular, if your group is uniformly perfect, that implies that the stable commutator length of every element is zero. Because what does it mean to be uniformly perfect? It means that every element can be written as a uniformly bounded number of commutators. And in that same blog post, Danny asked, well, what can we say about the mapping class group of the plane minus the Cantor set? So this question was answered by Juliet Bavard in 2016, where she showed that there actually exist elements of the mapping class group of the plane minus the Cantor set with strictly positive stable commutator length. So in particular, that says that this mapping class group of the plane minus the Cantor set cannot be uniformly perfect. Now, it turns out that there's a deep theorem of Christoph Bavard, which shows that stable commutator length of an element is zero, if and only if every non-trivial homeom every non-trivial homogeneous quasimorphism vanishes on that group element. And so what Juliet Bavard's result implies is that the second bounded cohomology of the mapping class group of the plane minus the Cantor set with real coefficients is infinite dimensional. And now I want to sort of contrast this result with a more recent result of Justin Malastin and Jing Tao from 2021, where they show that for some infinite type surfaces, the mapping class group of these collection of infinite type surfaces actually is uniformly perfect. And so we see that there's this rich connection between stable commutator length and big mapping class groups. So what do I show along with Priam and Alex? Well, we show that if S is an infinite type surface of type star, meaning that the mapping class group is locally coarsely bounded and every equivalence class of maximal ends is infinite, then we show three things about the stable commutator length function. Particularly, we show that the stable commutator length function is a continuous function from the commutator subgroup to the real line. We also show that the commutator subgroup is a Klopin subgroup of the mapping class group of the surface. And so in particular, this tells us that the commutator subgroup is actually a Polish topological group. And finally, we show that if we give the additional assumption that our surface has a tame end space and the mapping class group is CB generated, so in particular, these surfaces have well-defined quasi-isometry types, 
Then the mapping class group has a finitely generated abelianization. So what's the key step to the proof of all of these results? Well, the key thing that we need to do is we need to find a neighborhood of the identity in the mapping class group of the surface on which the commutator length function is actually uniformly bounded. And so what is this neighborhood of the identity going to look like? Well, it's going to look like the collection of all mapping class group elements that vanish on a compact subsurface. And so this turns out to be an open neighborhood of the identity in the mapping class group. So in particular, we can look at all elements that vanish on K, meaning they're supported on the complement of a finite subsurface or a compact subsurface. And the main tool that we're going to need to show this result is what I'm going to call the shift map homeomorphism. So here I have a strip and I'm sort of embedding a bunch of infinite type surfaces at every integer point along the strip. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift by one from the left to the right along this sort of strip in the middle and then taper to the identity on the boundary of the strip. And this is what I'm going to call the shift map. And what we show, I'm going to call this the shift map lemma, we show that if you have an end space, which is a self-similar set that contains a cantor set of maximal ends, then what we can do is we can find a countable collection of disjoint subsurfaces where each of these subsurfaces is, is homeomorphic to the same set the whole space. So here I have my end space that's a cantor set, and I've just broken it into a countable collection of sets whose end space is also a cantor set. And I also show that I can embed a strip and a shift map so that I can find this homeomorphism that shifts vi to vi plus one. And how do I do this? I do this exactly by embedding that strip that we saw on the other page into this infinite type surface and using a shift map. And so this, this map F is exactly my shift map on this strip, and then it just restricts the identity on the rest of the surface. So how do we use this shift map lemma? Well, it turns out that if I have a shift map, and if I have an element that's supported on one of these subsurfaces, it turns out that I can write that element as a commutator. I'm not going to tell you how that's done, but it's kind of a tool that's been used um, in many other situations. And you basically do sort of a ping pong back and forth type thing. But with that result, we can actually show that there exists a neighborhood of the identity in the mapping class group, such that the commutator length is uniformly bounded. So let's see how we do that. So we start with our end space. And we use this Mann and Rafi decomposition. Mann and Rafi tell us that if our surface is of type star, meaning it's locally coarsely bounded, then I can find this finite type subsurface K that partitions the end space nicely, such that each of these A's is a maximal end space. And our assumption is that there is a Cantor set of maximal ends. So I have a bunch of maximal end spaces and then some less complex subspaces. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this finite type subsurface K to split up each of those maximal end spaces into two homeomorphic pieces. So I split up A1 into A11 and A12, each of which is homeomorphic to the entire space A. And I'm going to let GI1, GI2, et cetera, so forth be some homeomorphism supported on each of these complementary components. And what I can do is I can use this shift map lemma to show that each of these GIJs is a commutator. And because this PI is homeomorphic into one of these AIs, each of these homeomorphisms supported on one of these less complex subsurfaces also has to be a commutator. And so in particular, if I have a homeomorphism, that's supported on the complement of this finite type surface K prime, it has to be the product of these GIJs with these PKs. And so in particular, that shows you that the commutator length is bounded by 2N plus M, where N was the number of 
self-similar N spaces, and M was the number of these less complex subsurfaces. And so just to remind you, this is what we use to show these three results. So what's an application of this theorem that we show about stable commutator length? Well, if G is an element of the mapping class group such that the stable commutator length is strictly positive, then because the stable commutator length is, the stable commutator length function is continuous, that tells us that for every mapping class H that's sufficiently close to this mapping class G, that the stable commutator length of H also has to be positive. So this sort of gives you a way of finding mapping classes that have positive stable commutator length as long as, as, long as you can find one of them. And so one thing that I wanna bring up is that if you're looking at a finite type surface, then most pseudo of homeomorphisms of finite type subsurfaces, oh, sorry, of finite type surfaces have positive stable commutator length. Now, this doesn't really hold in the infinite type setting. In particular, Juliette Bavard constructs mapping class groups of the plane, sorry, she constructs mapping classes of the plane minus the Cantor set, which act loxodromically on the ray graph. So these are exhibiting some sort of pseudo behavior in that they're acting loxodromically but they actually have zero stable commutator length. So there's something more nuanced that's going on in the setting of infinite type surfaces. And so one question that we want to figure out is if S is a surface of type star and Z is the collection of mapping classes that have zero stable commutator length, what can we say about this set? Can we say that they're in in terms of the relationship to between of being like pseudo nos of like because there's a sort of this big question in the world of infinite type surfaces of coming up with a nielsen thurston type classification of mapping class groups it's not going to be the same nice clean cut classification we have in the finite type surface world but we'd like some sort of analogy and so we might like to understand better the collection of mapping classes who have zero stable commutator length in particular so I think that's where I end now, and I will leave it open to questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so any questions to Elizabeth? Um, can, can you give uh, an example or two of a, of a, an element that, that has positive stable commutator length? Mm. Not yet, is the short answer. It turns out that these elements are hard to find. Oh. But you know they exist. Or? Well. Sorry, I thought that was part of exist... the Bavard result. Yeah, so she shows for the plane minus the Cantor set that they exist. Um, but for an arbitrary infinite type surface, I don't know that I can say for certainty. Well, actually, no, I guess if they're uniformly perfect, if the surface is uniformly perfect, there's not going to be any. So there's lots of examples in the Malstein tau paper. Um, but there are some infinite type surfaces that are not uniformly perfect. Um, and so those should have elements which have positive stable commutator length, but I couldn't necessarily tell you what they are. Possibly in George Domas' paper, he might construct. I'm not sure exactly how he shows his uniform perfectness result, but you might be able to leverage that to actually find some elements with positive stable commutator length. But yeah, I would have to think harder on that. Mm -hmm. Any any other questions? Okay, then thanks to Elizabeth. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs>